Thank you very much. Now, before we get into the word today, I do want to emphasize Pastor Francisco had no idea what I was going to share today, but it's actually activating that. Um, and it's a, it's a word God gave me earlier this week. So, Francisco, thank you for that word. I so honor the prophetic that you carry. Um, I will get a copy of that and continue to pray into that. I keep certain words. I mean, every prophetic word's a blessing, um, and and we we sort through them and we sift through them, and and I I listen to every one that I receive. And there's certain ones you get that you know there's. How do I want to say this? Because they're all a blessing, but there's an extra oil on. It's like it's like the molecules of your body vibrate to the voice of the Creator through the one prophesying over you. There's something Jody Hughes sent me many months ago that um, sits on the hassock in front of my prayer chair, and I pray through that prophetic word multiple times a week. Benjamin Dietrich prophesied something over me recently that even my wife texted me as I sat back down in that chair, and she said, honey, that was from the Lord. I could feel it as I was watching online. Honey, I know you're watching this morning, so I'll probably get a text from you about Francisco's word. But I pray through that word regularly, Benjamin. I'm going to record and write out and, and pray through that word regularly. So thank you for that, Francisco. I believe that's true. I believe it's the hour that we're in. Um, I have a whole nother message about staying in your lane in the midst of what God is doing, but I don't want to go there this morning. I want to, I want to be faithful to what the Lord has um, given me to say this morning. Real quick before I get into that, Pastor Francisco asked me to do one announcement, um, so I will do that. Um, We've got an event coming up on October 14th and 15th. It's our um, annual Heroes Arise Southwest event. So Heroes Arise Southwest 2022. But the Lord has given us a theme for this called Words of Fire. And what God has promised us actually is part of the word I'm going to preach this morning. It's something that has been stirring in me. God spoke to me in my prayer chair earlier this week. And he actually said this is a promise not only for our house and for the body, but for this event and so we, we brought in the people and have invited the people that the Lord highlighted, starting with Sergio Scataglini, who's preached in this house, an Argentinian revivalist who carries the holy fire of God. We're going to kick things off Friday night with Sergio releasing that fire. And then Friday during the day, a good friend of the house, a good friend of men on the front lines, Ryan Johnson is coming in from Tennessee, and he's carrying a word. You'll hear from me. You'll hear from Francisco. You'll hear from Dustin. But we're going on, on Friday night, we'll kick things off with Sergio releasing the fire. Then we're believing for it to continue and escalate Saturday morning. For, uh, sa yes, Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon, we have an event planned for you guys. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fellowship and brotherhood and a little bit of adventure. And then we'll come back here Saturday night, and we're going to have a worship and prophetic service. And we're believing for every single man to get a word from the Lord perhaps through one of us prophesying, but God's promise is that he's going to speak to the men as he spoke to Moses, because this is a time for men of God to arise and walk in all that we've been created for and called to. One of my personal passions, when I started Men on the Front Lines, when that got birthed, actually God started it, I just said yes to it. When, when the, the, the promise of God over that was that not so much there would be a new move of God amongst men, because many people said, oh, we need a new Promise Keepers. Is this going to be like Promise Keepers? And I said, I don't really know. Promise Keepers was before my time in Christ. I honor that. I've heard about that. I know it did great things. But the vision God gave me for men on the front lines wasn't so much this big um, 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 thing of where men come into a move of God and are touched, but where men become a move of God and go out and touch all of those around them. The goal of men on the front lines is not to be a move of God amongst men, but to make men a move of God in the spheres of influence that they're called to. And so we do these strategic events, we do these retreats, like Brad Carter and Ben Hughes and I do these retreats called man camps, where we go away for three days, and I won't go into all that. But then we do these, these mini men's conferences, like one night and one day. But God packs so much into these. And this is our Southwest event. So if you're watching online, you're more than welcome for the North and the East. Um, but this is going to be our Southwest event, and we invite you to come and be a part of it. For more information, you go to Men on the frontlines.com, click the events link, or you can email me, robert at men on the frontlines.com, and I'll get you that information. But uh, um, 
I guess it's a little corny, but it's also true. I'm super fired up about this Words of Fire event. I can't wait to see what God does. All right, let's get into this week's message or this morning's message, but let me pray first. Father, I thank you that you are here in our midst. And Lord, I thank you as we talk about the word that you've given to your body in this hour. We're really talking about you, and we're talking about your son, and we're talking about your Holy Spirit and your plans to move in our midst to achieve what you want for heaven in the earth in this hour. So Lord, I ask you to use this word to fulfill your heart's desire this morning for everyone here in the studio, everyone watching live online, and everyone who will watch later on demand. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message this morning is A Fire to, fuel, to Free You, to fool you, f- Fuel You, and to Further You. Let me re-say that and not stumble over it. A Fire to Free You, to Fuel You, and to Further You. And this came out of an encounter I had with the Lord earlier this week, one morning in my prayer chair. It was a prophetic word the Lord gave me. I released it earlier in the week. You might have seen it online about how we're entering a season of burning bush encounters. And that, I want to read to you what the Lord spoke to me as I wrote it down in my prayer chair. And this is it. We are entering a season of burning bush encounters. This is a time for fresh encounters that will release fresh vision restored mantles, and fresh fire that will burn up and consume things that have held believers back in the past. So the red phone has already rung, Pastor Francisco. This fresh fire will also be fresh fuel to further you and launch you into the callings and assignments of God, especially those callings and assignments that have seen long dormant or even dead. These burning bush encounters are a time for the seeds that have laid long dormant to be fueled and fertilized by the fire so that they break forth and blossom no matter how long they have been buried and no matter what they have been buried by. And I'll even say this, no matter who or what buried them. It might be us. We might have gotten in our own way. I don't have time to go into this this morning. God's working on a message in me right now through something he's been leading me through for the last several months. At times, the last several months have felt like the oil press, like I was being broken down all over again, seeing things in me that were hard to look at, but also grateful they were coming to the surface so I could give them to God. I know God is preparing us for revival But I personally believe so much of that begins with God preparing. He prepares us for revival by working a revival in us. Because sometimes the ugly things or the wicked things or the dark or difficult things that are hidden in my heart or I think I've dealt with or or what the Lord showed me, and I shared this last week, is I got discouraged because I felt like, am I fighting this battle again? And I think I shared this with you all last week. What the Lord showed me was, no, not really. What it is, is you've slain the lion, you've slain the bear, and now you're slaying the giant in the land. It feels like the same battle again, so I got discouraged. But the Lord said, no, you're going deeper and deeper, and you're dealing with it, and you're growing in authority, and now you're fighting the battle not just for you but for others. And I don't know why this is, maybe because it's kingdom. But when I think about fighting the battle for somebody else, I do way better than if I think, am I fighting this battle for me again? Come on, man, just grow up. But then when I realize, oh, wait, and for all of you who are prophetic feelers, you know what this is like. When you're a prophetic feeler, the way that works is you feel things. And I know that sounds like duh, and it is duh, but what I'm getting at is if you don't realize that's what you're doing, You just feel those things and don't realize God is tuning you into a battle. You just think, oh my gosh, am I wrestling with this thing again? No, you're overcoming that thing on behalf of seeing it torn down in the land, on behalf of others and the plans and purposes of God. So I was going through all of this and the Lord was showing me how we're actually taking the land, taking territory in the spirit, but it always begins with taking territory in ourselves. Every revival that's ever been birthed began with someone being willing to grab hold of a promise of God and not let go until they saw it fully manifested. And we've taught on revival in different revivals here. I've taught on some. Patricia's taught on some. But we see that historically, that's the model God gives us. Somebody has to be willing to go through the battles. 
And anybody who's walked in any measure of this knows what the battles are like. Ben and Jody can tell you stories. They stewarded a revival in Australia. They're helping to birth one now in the United States of America. Many of you can tell stories. All of you can tell stories. Because some of you are doing it in prayer. Some of you are doing it in your workplaces. Some of you are doing it in your bloodlines. But you're all doing something, and it matters. It matters to God. It matters to his plans and purposes in the hour. But I'm telling you, the devil is mean. So the devil will point to others and say, well, look at what they're doing. What you're doing doesn't matter, does it? Or the devil will point to the wrestles that you're having and saying, oh, you're just wrestling with this thing? Wow, really? As opposed to God will remind us, no, everything gets turned to the good. Every wrestle, every battle is unto something. I've told this story many times. I'm not going to tell it again. Those of you who have heard it, it'll be a good reminder. Those of you who have not, I hope it empowers you. That one of my lowest times in my 12-year health battle when I was so low, so discouraged. I was sitting in my prayer chair, but I wasn't praying. I was whining and complaining. I was murmuring. I felt like I'd prayed every prayer I could possibly pray. I had every single person, the who's who of the charismatic healing zoo, Patricia being a wonderful spiritual mother, had brought them in to do conferences and serve the body of Christ, but with also the agenda of, for those of us on the team who were wrestling with things, getting prayer. And every time somebody with a big name came in, I would be one of the first, no matter how weak, I was like the woman with the issue of blood. I would push my way to the front, not through people, but through weakness and discouragement and despair and frustration frustration and weariness. I would push my way and I'd have so much faith and they'd pray for me and nothing would seem to happen. And I was sicker than I'd ever been. I was weaker than I'd ever been. I had $38,000 in medical debt at that point. I was really discouraged. I was really having a hard time. And I was pouring my heart out to God and I, I, I challenged him and thankfully he is truly, and I mean this, he is truly a merciful God. Because my challenge was just awful. It was, Lord, either manifest my healing Bring me home to heaven or take away my faith because this isn't fair. I know your word is true, but I'm not seeing it. So either bring forth the healing now or let's just be done with this and bring me home to heaven. I wasn't married. I didn't have a family then. And I, I knew heaven would be better. Or, and this is the part I know he's merciful about it. It makes me sad to think about. But I actually said, or take away my faith because it's not fair to believe in this, this strongly, but not see it. And the Lord took me into a vision, and this is the part I've shared. The Lord took me into a vision, and it was at the end of my days. I knew it was many, many years in the future. And his arms were around me, and he was walking me into heaven, and I was entering my reward. And all of a sudden, all these people started walking up to me and saying, Robert, thank you for when you ministered healing to me. Robert, thank you for when you ministered healing to me. Thank you for the healing miracle you released to me, Robert. And I turned to the Lord, and I said, God, you know me. I'm not very good with names, but I'm really good with faces. I don't recognize any of these people. When did I pray for them? And the Lord looked at my eye and he said, every time you declared I am the Lord who heals, that word went forth and someone was touched. What you didn't realize is you weren't just contending for a manifestation for you. You were contending for a great healing move of God. And he said, let me ask you this. What if... The greatest call upon your life. What if greater than the call to be a prophetic voice? Greater than a call to the nations. What if the greatest call upon your life is to be my Job in this hour? And to resist the enemy no matter what. And to declare, I am the Lord who heals no matter what. And declare that there was healing at the cross no matter what. What if... That releases such a substance of faith that the next generation of preachers that you are birthing will move in the greatest healing move of God that's ever been seen in the earth and it will bring me more glory and more souls than you can imagine. Now, here was my response. Family time, true, vulnerable. My, my first response was, Lord, does that mean I won't see my healing? I was still focused on me. And the Lord firmly, lovingly, but firmly, so firmly said, that's not what I said. And as soon as he spoke that, there were volumes in it. And I realized the firmness was he's basically saying to me, get thee behind me, Satan. 
Not because I was Satan, but because that lie that was catching me up in self and fear and doubt and limiting me, he was ordering it to be removed so I could get free of the fear and doubt of self. Free of the, what about me? What about me? And realize, God, I want to give you whatever you want. And that was my second response. I knew what he was saying was I would see the manifestation of my healing because I've seen it through the cross. But that every single moment of that battle was slaying giants and achieving kingdom purposes because what I wrestled with the most was I felt sidelined. I felt like I wasn't in my calling. I felt like everybody else was moving into what they were called for. But God had to break me free of this perspective of me, 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 me. And help me see, no, God, it's you. And whatever battle you need me to fight, I will do so. And I will do it in your strength and it will achieve your purposes. That moment is one of the greatest burning bush encounters I've ever had. I didn't realize that what it was at the time. But that's what burning bush moments do. Burning bush moments are all about uh, realigning us and reactivating us and reigniting us in kingdom vision, kingdom mandates, kingdom assignments, kingdom mantles, kingdom anointings, and kingdom purposes. When we have a burning bush moment, all those things that have been limiting, hindering, interfering, all those things that have caused seeds and, 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 and the things of God in our lives to lay dormant or to be buried or feel dead, they all get burned away. Burning bush moments help us deal with and remove the things that have tripped us up, held us back, blocked, hindered, interfered with, or delayed us from walking in the things that we've been called to. Let me reread this word to you. We are entering a season of burning bush encounters. This is a time for fresh encounters that will release fresh vision, restored mantles, and fresh fire that will burn up and consume things that have held believers back in the past. This fresh fire will also be a fresh fuel to further you and launch you out into the callings and assignments of God, especially those callings and assignments that have seemed long dormant or even dead. These burning bush encounters are a time for the seeds that have laid long dormant to be fueled and fertilized by the fire so that they break forth and blossom no matter how long they've been buried and no matter what they have been buried by. So we're coming into this season of burning bush encounters because God is getting us ready for something. And I, I apologize, I don't remember if it was you, Ben, or you, Jody, but there was a, a time, I think it was in one of our prayer mornings, where as we could feel the build towards revival that's going on, either Ben or Jody and their wisdom and experience in stewarding a revival talked about how in the buildup to revival, God does things in us, and it often we'll see things in ourselves or we'll wrestle with things in ourselves. And I want to thank you both for that because I've gone back to that again and again and again to remind myself, I'm not failing, I'm fueling. I'm not failing. I'm being refined. I'm not failing. I'm letting a revival come up in me so I can release revival in whatever way God has called me to in my gifts and my mandates. This is what burning bush moments are all about. Think of Moses. Let's look at the, the great biblical example of the burning bush mo mo moment. Moses had a calling and a vision from the Lord. I, I don't have time to go all through Exodus 1 and 2. Let's, let's paraphrase that part of it. Um, Moses is born in a difficult and challenging season. There's been a shift in the land. Let's actually go back before his birth just for a moment. There's been a shift in the land from when the people of God were highly favored in Egypt. And now a new king, a new ruler a new territorial spirit, perhaps we could say, has come into to overseeing the land, and it is anti-God's people. Can anybody relate? Yeah. It's anti, and again, we're talking about powers and principalities. We may see it through people, but we're talking about powers and principalities. We're not talking about parties. We're not talking about politics. We're not talking about people. Even in Exodus 1, this might have been a king instituting these policies, but it was the enemy and his powers and principalities working through that king. The king was not the problem. Satan was the problem and has been since Genesis 3, right? 
when God said this is what's going what's to happen, but, but through Christ, through the seed that would come forth of God, we will see victory. So there's a shift in the land. Now the ruler of the land is against God's people, puts all these burdens on God's people, and even wants to see God's people killed. Saying, you know, this is the way we'll drive out the line of the, the, uh, uh, the, the seed of God through the Hebrew people, through the Israel people. Whenever there is a baby uh, Israelite born, a boy, throw him in the river and kill him. But the, uh, the nursemaids won't do it because they have a fear of the Lord. Or the midwives won't do it because they have a fear of the Lord. So he comes up with another strategy. We don't have time to go into all that. But it's, um, um, if you're not just going to kill them, actually I have it backwards. If you're not just going to kill them as soon as they're born, um, throw them in the Nile. And so they don't kill them as soon as they're born. And so when Moses comes forth, they hide him for three months. And then his mother puts him in the basket. And the story we all know happens. And he's pulled out by the, uh, the, the princess, the servant of the princess. God uh, outmaneuvers the enemy in all of this. I think it's Miriam, if I remember the name correctly. His sister says, hey, do you want me to find a nursemaid? And of course, that's her mother, Moses' mother. And one of the things I noticed as I've been reading back through this that I didn't really notice before is it's not clear, but it says when he was older, he was returned to the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's daughter. So actually, he is raised in Hebrew culture for a little while. I don't know how long. I haven't studied that out yet. But I never noticed that. And I thought, so he did grow up with a sense of who he was and what he was called to. So then he goes into Pharaoh's court, obviously. And now we get into the meat of it. He has a sense of who he is. He has a sense of what he's been born for. He has a sense of who his people are. And even though he's now a prince of Egypt, when he sees uh, he he sees an Egyptian uh, guard beating a slave, he gets angry because how dare you come against the people of God, my people. And he ends up killing the Egyptian guard. Then later he sees two Hebrews fighting and he's starting to walk in his calling. I'm the deliverer of my people. I've set them free from the attack of Egypt last week. Now I'm going to set them free from division amongst themselves. And so he says, he says, what are you doing? Why fight amongst yourselves? And the one turns to him and says, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me like you killed that guard last week? And Moses freaks out. Moses, it says, was afraid because he didn't realize that everybody knew. So he flees. He flees his people. He flees his calling. He flees everything. And he goes to the backside of nowhere for 40 years. Let's pick this up in Exodus 3 now. I'm reading verse 1 through 10 through my old new living. So just before I get into that, this is where Moses is. He has a calling. He has a vision. He tried to step out into it, and it went sideways. He's wandering in the wilderness, and he's tending someone else's flock, you'll see. At this point, in Exodus 3, verse 1, at this point, Moses looks and feels like an unwanted, rejected failure. Probably feels like his best years are behind him. He's wandered the wilderness as long as he had been alive. He'd been in Egypt for 40 years, then he's in the backside of nowhere for 40 years. He's 80 years old, feeling like a failure, feeling like a 'er ne'er-do-well, feeling like an also-ran, feeling like a never-was, feeling like his best years are behind him, and he's probably feeling like he missed out on or messed up his calling and destiny beyond repair. And all of the circumstances look like that. Talk about seeds that were dormant, buried, or seem dead. So now here we are, Exodus 3, verse 1. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law. Catch that? 40 years into this career on the backside of nowhere, he doesn't even have his own flock. Think about that. He's tending his father-in-law's flock. He has nothing to show for this. Jethro, the peace Midian, and he went deep into the wilderness near Sinai, the mountain of God. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord appeared to him as a blazing fire in a bush. Moses was amazed because the bush was engulfed in flames. He's having a burning bush encounter. But it didn't burn up. Amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go over to see this. We'll come back to that in just a second. When the Lord saw he had caught Moses' attention, God called to him from the bush. Moses, Moses, Here I am, Moses replied. All right, let's unpack some really important things here that have to do with burning bush encounters. So Moses sees, it says the angel of the Lord. 
Now, there's a whole theological can of worms we can open there about what the word angel there means. It means messenger. There's a theological can of worms that this could actually point to the pre-incarnate Christ, um, which I personally believe, but don't want to go too far down that road this morning. But the reason I'm pointing this out is I want you to catch, and later on in Exodus 3, we see clearly where it says it's the Lord who is speaking to him. So this is not just an angel of fire in the bush. This is not an angel of the Lord who is a seraphim in fire. This is the Lord's presence itself burning in this bush. How do we know this? Because who is the Lord our God? He's the great I am. Why does the bush burn but not be consumed? Well, because it's the great I am. Why does a fire burn down? Why would a bush burn down? Because time passes. God is only present tense. So when the great I am is present, there is only the present tense I amosity of our God. This is what Moses encounters. Why is it important? Because everything looks dead, dormant, and buried, messed up, or missed out on. But when the I am shows up, everything is present tense once again. The failure of the past is removed. The mistakes of the past are removed. The victories of the enemy are removed. It is present tense when you encounter a burning bush moment with the I amosity of the great I am. So this get Moses' attention. It's not only, hey, look, a fire. He's probably seen a fire in the desert before. There are lightning strikes. We see dry lightnings here all the time. He's been shepherding for 40 years. He's seen a fire in the desert before. He's seen a cactus or a bush burn before. It wasn't, oh, look, a fire, fascinating. That'd be like saying, oh, a blue car, fascinating. No, you see him all the time. It was the present tense power of the now of God in his I amosity, and something in Moses realized, I want to encounter the present tense power of God and be reminded that all of these things that seem dead, dormant, missed out on, or messed up are still just as alive, just as active, because God is present tense. So the bush is burning and it gets his attention. This is key. One translation, I looked it up last night and I wasn't finding it, but one I read somewhere said, Moses turned aside from the path that he'd been on. The burning bush encounter is an invitation. The season is a promise. But the, the, in that promise of the season, it's an invitation if we will allow God to get our attention right now. I didn't like dealing with things that were coming up in my heart recently, but I knew I had to because I knew God was getting my attention. He wasn't saying, oh, you're really blowing it, son. I knew he was getting my attention to deal with things that are long, long. Ago. I'm dealing with bloodline issues right now. And I'm grateful to do it. God is showing me patterns on one side of my family. And, I'm, and they're going to end in my generation. I'm going to war for my bloodline because I have nephews and nieces that will be walking in so much victory because things are getting settled in our bloodline this generation in this season. That's what burning bush encounters are about. So Moses, God gets Moses' attention and it says, I must go over to see this. Moses responds to the invitation. Respond to the invitation. And I want to remind you of something Sergio said that had such impact on me. One of the mistakes we sometimes make as the body is we look for results instead of rewards. Now, we should expect results. Every time I pray healing for someone, I expect to see the healing because we were given it at the cross. So, of course, I expect to see it. But if I don't see it, I, if I don't see it manifest in that moment, I have learned through my 12-year journey, things are being accomplished. What have we said? The only time God doesn't meet our expectations is when he's going to exceed them. So don't get disappointed or push back against understandable disappointment when God doesn't meet your expectation. He's not failing. The enemy's not winning. God wants to exceed your expectations. Expect God all the time, but don't expect your expectations of God more than you expect God. 
And I'm learning this all over. We're going to see such glorious things in this house. I am telling you, we are going to see such glorious things in this house. So Moses' response, I had three nights last week where I was really tired. I was overcoming a bug, just a natural bug. I was falling asleep right, like 10, 1030 every night. But I was like awake, not wanting to be awake, 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 like 1, 1.15, 1 145. And a couple times I thought, well, it's just my body gets out of whack when I'm overcoming bugs. So I thought maybe that's it. But by the second night, I, I could feel God drawing me. And sometimes I was up for like two hours and I really wanted to sleep. But I would get up and I would sit in my prayer chair and I'd say, Lord, you have my attention. And one night I sat for two hours and 15 minutes and nothing seemed to happen. Except I would return my thoughts to him. God, I'm here. You have my attention. And I'm going to be honest. At first I wrestled. There was this part of me that's like, God, if you're not going to say anything, let me go to sleep. I mean, I'm all down to have a conversation. But if you're not going to say, the one night as I'm seeking him, all I heard him say was, remember, I'm sitting right here. And I got so excited. I was like, yeah. That was like in the first 15 minutes. Like, yeah. So I'm focusing on the spot he's showing me. I'm like, thank you that you're right here. We're commuting heart to heart. Uh, for another hour, I'm just sitting there. And? 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 Hello? I know you're sitting right there, and I know you didn't have a stroke, but hello? Nothing. Two more nights like that. I'm like, God, okay, I remember you're sitting. But I had to remember don't look for a result. Something is going on in this moment. Something is building. I can't imagine. Lord, let it be this morning for every single person here. The fire that will manifest because of a willingness to meet with him. So when he gets your attention, respond. And don't make it about results. Expect results. Realize results are going to come forth, but it doesn't have to be in that moment. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, God told him. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. What did God just say to him? Do something to mark that you recognize you're in new territory, son. This is new territory. Everything just shifted for you. Forget where you've walked. Forget your 40 years of all that. This is holy ground. This is me time. You and me. You're meeting with the I am. Everything shifts here and now. Do not come any closer, God told him. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. You are standing in a new place, God is saying. Then he said, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What is he saying? He's saying, I just want to remind you who I am and what I do. Every one of your ancestors that you revere is a great man of faith and a great man of God. I want to remind you they came from your bloodline. They were just men until they said yes to me. They were just men who wrestled with challenges and fears and doubts. They were just men who had economic difficulties and political difficulties in the days they inhabited, but they trusted me and I did great things in them and through them. He is not saying, live up to your lineage. He's saying, remember your lineage and what I did in it. Because I can do the same for you now that I have your attention. Come on, Abraham Lord, I got to think of a good word for this. Trafficked his wife twice. Twice. I mean, one time you're going, really? Seriously? I mean, I'm married to a lovely woman. I can't imagine like saying, honey, when, um, when we get to London this time, if there's any churches that aren't going to receive me, would you go give the pastor a little kiss on the cheek maybe? Give me a little favor with him? Of course I'd never do that. He did worse. And God convicted him of it. And then he did it again. Now, I'm not finding fault with Abraham. I'm actually realizing, thank, thank you, Lord, I don't wrestle in that area. But we all wrestle in some area. God is not calling us to perfection. He sent the perfect one on our behalf because he knew we can't walk in it. But God is also not saying, hey, sin's no big deal. I got it covered in the perfect one. He's saying, no. This is a season to be reminded who I am. This is a season to re be reminded of what I'm capable of. 
This is a season to be reminded that no matter how you've messed up or how you've missed out in the past, I am bigger than all of it because I will do this in my power now that I have your attention and you give me your yes. When Moses heard this, he hid his face in his hand because he was afraid to look at God. Now, I want to submit something for you to consider. I don't read this as, oh, the presence of God, I can't even look at it. He was drawn to that. I personally, and maybe this is just based on where I've been, I think the reason he had trouble looking at God is, yes, there was awe, but I also think it's because he was looking at himself in front of God and realizing how he'd failed. Because the first thing he thinks of is, yeah, you're the God of Abraham. You're the God of Isaac. You're the God of Jacob. And here I am. You've given me so much. You've promised me so much. And I really didn't steward it that well. And I actually denied and ignored it for 40 years. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I think he was having as much trouble looking at himself as looking at God. I once had a two-hour visitation of the fear of the Lord, and it messed me up for three weeks. I had trouble looking at God. Why? Because I saw the things in my heart that needed to be dealt with. But God actually gave me a list of things to pray through. He had me write them out in black pen on a yellow legal pad during this visitation. He had me write out the things in my heart he wanted to deal with. And then as I prayed through them, he said, run a red line with a red pen through each of them to remind you that these are dealt with by the blood of Jesus. So in the presence of the fear of the Lord, I did this. And for three weeks, I would think about that and think, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I think that's what Moses was going through. It's not an easy thing, but it's a beautiful thing. Then the Lord told him, you can be sure I have seen the misery of my people and of Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from the harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. I won't go into this for time's sake, but I want to briefly say in regards to the United States of America, in regards to your nation where you're watching from, I want to tell you, no matter how dark or wicked or unrighteous it looks and feels right now, no matter how much it may feel like we've been crying out for years and it seems to get darker and darker, I want to tell you God is very aware of what's going on in our nation. He's heard every one of your prayers, every one of your cries, God wants us to know that in this hour. That's part of what burning bush moments are about. Part of a burning bush moment is letting go of any offense or frustration or confusion we have towards, God, where have you been? One of the words the Lord gave me, I think I've shared it with you several months ago, coming into the year, is he said, it's really important that my people watch over their hearts right now because what the devil's going to do is in this season when I'm setting things up for a great victory, it's an Exodus 14 time, God's going to deal with the enemy. At the end of Exodus 14, it says, and the enemy will never be seen again. All of the enemy were destroyed, never to be seen again. But what, was, what preceded that? A lot of battle, a lot of the enemy mustering, a lot of the enemy showing themselves strong, a lot of the people of God murmuring and complaining and being freaked out. We are in an Exodus 14 season where God is working. He's out chessing. He's out maneuvering the devil on the chessboard. But the Lord told me, tell the people to watch over their hearts because in this season, the enemy is going to twist or try to twist the thoughts of my people because while I'm maneuvering behind the scenes in ways they don't understand, my people need to make sure they don't do what my disciples did. Come to me and cry out, do you not care that we are drowning? They didn't just say, Jesus, do something. They questioned his heart. Do you not care? Burning bush moments, God reminds us, I'm there, I'm aware, I care, and I'm up to something. And in that, all that other stuff falls away. Let me hurry up. So I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own land. So he talks about what he's going to do. Let me fast forward here. Now go, for I am sending you. Oh, I missed an important part. There is one thing I have to point out. Where is it? Uh, so, verse 8. So, I have come to rescue them. So, God says, I have come to rescue my people. Then, in verse 10, he says, go, for I am sending you. Did God change his mind? 
No, God is saying, I'm going to do it. I just need you to walk with me in it. You have a role to play. The first thing God does is remind Moses who he is, what he's capable of, what he's done, and what he will do. Once Moses has accepted that, now he's able to say, okay, now you go, because you're going to do this with me. You have a role to play. Go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You will lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So at the burning bush, God reminds Moses of his calling and reactivates it in the present tense power of his I amosity. Moses' initial response is to have all sorts of doubts and questions. You can read through the rest of Exodus 3 and 4. But Moses' response is not, yay, God! Moses' response is, who, me? You know, I'm old, I stutter. I don't know that they'll receive me. I don't know. That God deals with all of it. And usually by declaring, I am. He's saying, present tense, baby. Present tense, baby. Present tense, baby. The I am of God will refire, reaffirm, reactivate, refresh, reignite all of those things that seem dormant or dead. Moses uh, has all sorts of doubts and questions that keep him from stepping out and moving forward. God deals with them all at the burning bush. God wants revival more than we do. God wants crusades more than we do. God wants souls saved even more than we do. This is a season of harvest. This is a season of revival. I am telling you, it's for the lost 100% but it's also for each and every one of you. God wants a revival in you. There are things God wants to revive in you. There are callings he wants to revive in you, anointings he wants to revive in you, bloodline blessings he wants to revive in you, anointings and empowerments and blessings he wants to revive in you. Why? Because then you become a walking crusade. Because you put Jesus on display everywhere you go and people are drawn to that. There will be those who have crusades with tens of thousands of people in stadiums. We're praying into them, believing that for Ben and Jody and the teams that they're raising up. We know what God is going to do through them. But I want to tell you, you are meant to be a walking crusade. You are meant to be a walking revival. You are meant to represent and represent God everywhere you go because you will reach people that might not show up at a meeting. And that one is worth going after and you're perfect for it. That's what the burning bush encounters are all about. You may, the, the, you may need to be revived in a call to stadiums because maybe the devil's been lying to you and saying, Ben and Jody are doing it. I guess I'm not going to get to. No, you look at what Ben and Jody are doing. You cheer them on. I highly encourage you sow into what they're doing because you're sowing into your future, your destiny. It's just a different time for you. And then for some of you, maybe you're called to something else. But whatever it is, God wants to reignite, reaffirm, refocus all of that. Real quickly, I want to something Benjamin Dietrich and I did a, a conversation together recently online. And it was so powerful. And he pointed something out in the conversation that fits into this. Because it is a harvest season. And we should be thinking about the lost and thinking about others. But I want you to know God is thinking about you because you're part of his plans and purposes. And these burning bush encounters are just for that. So we were looking at the harvest. And we looked at Mark 9, 37. And also Luke 10, 2 says the same thing. Then this is Jesus talking. He said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Benjamin pointed something out. Benjamin, I hope you're not there. Well, since you're not here, I'm comfortable saying this. I hope you don't mind that I'm now borrowing this because it was so good. But he pointed out that word few in the Greek is oligos. And it not only means few in number, but it also means puny. So it could be, you could describe it not only few in number, um, not just undersized in numbers, but also undersized in power. Another way you can translate that word is neutered. So Jesus is absolutely calling more, call more harvesters into the harvest field, for they are few. Call more in, call more in. Absolutely, but he's also saying, everyone that goes, I want plentiful and powerful in my presence, my power, my anointing, and the vision that I've given them and the calling that I've given them. Jesus is dealing with anything in us that feels puny, anything in us that feels dead, anything in us that feels dormant. He is releasing us into a season of burning, bush encounters to reignite, reaffirm, reinvigorate, and refire all those seeds. 
that have seen den or dormant. What, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this word over you one more time. I'm going to ask Adam to come up and play. I'm going to declare this word over all of you here and all of you online. And then what I want to do is I also want to invite our prayer team up and the pastors up. Because once I declare this word over you, we're going to activate it. And if there's anyone here that relates to this word, and let's be real and even vulnerable, needs this word. If you need a release of fresh or refreshed vision, if you feel like you need a mantle restored in you, if you need a fresh fire that will burn up and consume things that have held you back in the past, if you need fresh fuel to further you and to launch you out into what you know you've been called to and the assignments of God are, especially callings and assignments that have seemed dormant or even dead, if you feel like you missed out or you feel like you messed up to the point of where it's never going to happen, thank you. This word is for you. And I want you, once I finish reading this word, to come forward. And we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe for the fire to come. Because God has a burning bush encounter for you. But when you come forward, I'm going to ask something of you. I don't want you to come forward thinking maybe God will do something. Hoping maybe God will do something. I want you to come forward because through this word, God has gotten your attention and you are responding. I want you to come forward if you feel like this is my moment, Lord. If you blast me through the back wall of this place and I know I've encountered the fire of God, I will rejoice. But even if I come forward knowing this is my moment, knowing you've gotten my attention, knowing I'm responding and you'll respond to my response and you feel nothing, you will go forth from this place knowing I have turned my attention to God and I'm entering into my burning bush season. Now I'm believing for every single person here and online, as I declare this word to be touched. Some of you started having burning bush encounters in the worship this morning. That's one of the things I was praying for this morning. Some of you started to feel it as I was preaching and, and declaring this prophetic word. Some of you will feel it when we minister to you here this morning. Some of you will feel it online as I declare this word over you afresh. But if you're here and if you're online, you can do something as simple as extending your hand out to the screen or anything like that. But come forward because you're declaring, God, you got my attention and I'm entering into my season of burning bush encounters. We are entering a season of burning bush encounters. This is a time for fresh encounters that will release fresh vision. This is a time of fresh encounters that will release fresh and restored mantles and fresh fire that will burn up and consume things that have held you back in the past. This fresh fire that God is releasing in this burning bush season will also be fresh fuel to further you and launch you out into the callings and assignments of God, especially those callings and assignments that have seemed long dormant or even dead. These burning bush encounters are a time for the seeds that have laid long dormant to be fueled and fertilized by the fire so they break forth and blossom no matter how long they've been buried and no matter what they have been buried by. Now, I'm gonna start praying over all of you, but any of you here in the studio that wanna respond to this, I want you to come forward. Our prayer team's gonna start praying for you. I'm gonna pray for all of you online as well. Thank you, Lord, for this season of burning bush encounters that we've entered into. We've declared that word three times this morning, and we thank you that you are going to confirm that word with signs that follow. I release the burning bush fire of God. I release the present tense power of the I am out to every single person online right now in Jesus' mighty name. I declare your season of burning bush encounters has come right now in Jesus' name. May the fire of God fall upon you. May the fire of God fall upon you. May every fear and every doubt, every disqualifying thought be burned up and removed now. I declare this is your present tense 
season and every seed that is laid dormant, every mantle, every calling that has seen delayed, anything you think you've missed out on or messed up on, I declare right now it's being consumed by the present tense fire of the great I am. In Jesus' name, go forth from this moment activated, refreshed, reignited, refocused in the mighty power of Jesus Christ into all that you're called to do in every sphere of influence you're called to. In Jesus' name, amen.